I forgot how brutal that was. I know. It's in this episode, but more specifically, this scene that I personally see as the moment that One Piece lights the ignition for the rest of the series. This is episode 37, and it's in this sequence that breaks down that huge entry barrier for most being the many episodes found within One Piece's vast catalog. This wall is smashed down in dramatic fashion, both figuratively and literally, and we'll break it all down for you now. But first, thank you for tuning in. I am Kirk D. Cam. And I'm Scryerman, and this is the Will of the Scry. Before we get to the analysis, I think it's important to set the scene. This is Nami. She's the one who is repeatedly stabbing her arm with this knife, and for good reason. And she's been terrorized by this man. Not exactly a man, he's a fish man. But you get the point. He has reigned over her village, herself, and everyone she knows for the last eight years. When she was just a child, he murdered her mother. He took everything from her. And then, he made her work for him. Under the sole premise that if she collected 100 million berries, he would set her free. And this leads us to this exact moment where she finds out and everything is crumbling down. And it leads her to violently react in the way you just watched. So with all that being said, let's jump into the analysis. We just saw Nami get stabbed. What was, what was your reaction when you saw her pull that knife that it was on the ground? Did you, what did you think in that, in that glimpse second? Well, <laughs> I was expecting maybe a cutaway. I was expecting maybe a, a misdirect, um, but they went for it and they showed, they showed it. One um, of the most gruesome scenes. Into her and it's gruesome for so many reasons, right? This community of people who watches anime shows, anything, even things like Game of Thrones, right? Like we are used to violence and we're used to blood and gore. I mean, people seek it these days, but it was something about the story and how everything was set up and knowing how deeply troubled and lost and out of control she was that made that scene so, so, visceral as she picks up this this knife and starts repeatedly stabbing her arm where the tattoo is that was there's deep. a lot in that yeah and you know like you mentioned we kind of desensitized to violence and anime but i think there's a lot a big difference when you kind of slow it down home in and it's uh someone doing it to themselves and you're thinking how did you get to this point that was, that was the point of the show when, that, that made it real. She spent eight years just with this, the one purpose of making money and stealing, and the only way she knew how was to be, you know, this, this Robin Hood-esque character, this figure. Um, and the exact moment where she finds she just got cheated. All of it is gone. All of it. Her eight years of her life where she's pushed people away, refused to let anyone in, all dedicated to making enough money to save this town. This, this place that she loves where her mother passed. She's been doing this, putting on this brave face and all of it in that moment is gone. And she feels so uncontrollably helpless. It's hard to imagine eight years of your life dedicated to one cause under pretenses. When we see Nami, Nami's backstory with her stepmother who was a Marine, gave up everything for them mm -hmm. to settle a home for them and then gave up everything again to save to them protect their literal lives mm -hmm. um and so and not like just it, their literal lives and 
to show them that she values them as her family above all else. Exactly. And especially, you got to think there's got to be some added guilt because Nami was, you know, she was a kid, but she was kind of questioning whether she wanted to be part of that family, whether she was serious or not. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in that moment where she's clawing and stabbing at the tattoo as well, she could even be regressing back to being a little girl in the moment where Arlong killed their mother and her only choice was to follow this plan. So as soon as that plan and that little bit of hope, mm. the second it's taken away, it's complete breakdown and she's just reaching for whatever she can to attack Arlong. In that very moment, the only piece of control she had was the one thing on her arm. The, the mark that he had tattooed on her as a little girl and so that happened she's going at her arm stabs her quite a few times and all of a sudden a hand just comes out stops it you know who it is it's luffy and he's sitting there just holding it and she looks up and she continues to push him away and i mean she has never had anyone in her life that she could trust how are these random pirates who, who are not even necessarily like, I mean, they are just claiming to be pirates for all accounts at that point. They only have three people on the crew, not including her or four people. They are here to help her. And she's saying, no, I don't want you. She has grown to care. As much as she wants her village to survive, she doesn't want anything, any harm to come by the way of probably the most genuine people outside of her sister and her mother um, she's ever met in her whole life on these journeys even just on her little adventures with luffy and, and the gang she's she's grown to love them to her at that point it was just a pipe dream like yeah it would have been nice but she never thought as a reality because at the time we didn't know her reality but we do now and her reality is dark and it's deep this random pirate who's made out of rubber comes and grabs her arm and the only thing she can do at that point is she has so many pent up emotions starts flinging dirt at him and telling him to go away if you were put in that situation or i was we'd probably do the same exact thing so she pushes him away and this is a very powerful form of writing where you let the silence speak for itself and i'm really glad that that was the approach that Oda took. I mean, he could be giving her a speech, he could be talking her down, but he just lets it ride out. She just looks up at Luffy and she goes, Luffy, help me. <laughs> and you think about everything leading up to that scene, to that point, and again, how she's pushed people away her whole life. And for her to just break down like that, and actually ask for help and how that all translated in one single scene was masterful the next point is luffy's reaction and he has a way of doing this you haven't seen too much yet but he has a way of knowing despite how much of a goofball he is a master of the people in a very odd way he knows exactly how to approach a situation his way and it's a way that a normal person wouldn't approach it. After he waits for her to get to that point, because he knows that she needs to get there on her own, where she is the one asking him for help, he puts his hat on her head. You know, this is his ultimate treasure. This hat means everything to him, and he wouldn't trust it to anyone unless it's someone that obviously means a lot to him or he's putting it in the possession of someone for the sake of a purpose because he knows if he's giving you this hat he's coming back for it after he's done his job after he's done what he needs to do which is to save nami nami and the town and everyone around it but specifically once he's done his business to help nami and up until that point, too, and it was apparent when we went back and rewatched an older episode, you never really see Luffy look distressed unless it's that hat. Even when he was comforting Nami, I don't think Luffy himself looked distressed because he knew what to do with the situation. But if there's one thing that gives him panic and Anxiety, maybe throws yeah. him off a little bit, it's if that hat's out of reach. So he puts the hat on Nami, and 
from that point on puts in sequence what what I think is one of the most epic and underrated I think not talked about points of this is he starts walking to uh, away from her and they're waiting are the three members of the crew Zoro, Sanji, and Usopp all in their epic poses and they heard the whole thing just like Luffy knew what to do at that very moment they knew they just needed to put their trust in Luffy that he'd handle the situation correctly and they waited all three of them were ready to rock and I think one thing and another point that isn't talked about enough uh, about this moment as they're walking towards Arlong Park to address the situation is how new Sanji was to the crew at that point he knew Nami as this girl that he served a drink at dinner and then she just stole the the eventual pirate group that he was going to join ship and dipped that was his only interaction with with her but from hearing the story from Nami's sister just a couple episodes beforehand that's all he needed to know he was just as deeply moved as Zoro, Usopp, and Luffy had spent at that point, you know, a fair amount of time with this girl to actually get to know her true self and not just the front that she was putting on. Like, up to this point, Luffy makes a lot of decisions on screen that you could say, well, he's kind of being dumb. But I think this is one of those times where he never doubted Nami when they reported to him that she had killed Usopp. He was the only one who defended her and then when the time came they they recognized that he was right um he saw something they didn't um maybe that's a continuing theme i'm not sure but that's a defining moment for me where where luffy stuck with the decision that affected his whole crew as a captain it's interesting that you bring that up because luffy wasn't the only one who did that Zoro, who tends to, to march to the beat of his own drum as well in a lot of ways, picked up on the same thing. The only difference between him and Luffy is that he likes to verify things. Luffy just refused to acknowledge that she was evil in any capacity without any proof. But Zoro was able to test it out of her when he basically just pushed himself in the water because he knew she was going to save him and he at that point knew it was all a ruse. So they both had their methods of getting there but it's interesting that they both were able to come to that conclusion on their own. So that's a great point that you bring up and again Sanji's just a simp so he was all in on her from the <laughs> beginning. Um, so the last the last part that I want to talk about it's after Luffy picks up the, the crew and starts walking towards the park. You have the, the masterful soundtrack that is overtaken. It's it's one of my favorite soundtracks throughout the whole show. But they arrive at the wall. Arlong is doing his signature laugh, and all of a sudden you hear some bashes. <laughs> Everyone's eyes in the show is like, what is going on? Pants to the wall. In in movie writing, there's this thing called a rising action, which leads into the climax. The thing about this entire scene and how it was illustrated by Oda from the top down is it puts you through a roller coaster of emotions of holy <laughs> shit, I feel so bad to exasperated, you're gasping as she's stabbing herself, to this sense of relief that Luffy is there to catch her, and then this feeling of epicness as he picks up his crew, walks towards the gate. That is the whole rising action of the scene. And it's not a normal rising action. It takes you on that roller coaster of different emotions. And this leads us to the climax of the entire sequence as Luffy gallantly punches down the wall, breaking down the barrier between him and Arlong and to the entire series. Thank you for tuning in. This is Will Descry.